Hey. Hey, Apache. How you doing? Yeah, I'm good yourself. I'm great. Thanks for sitting down and doing this. Yeah. So you're at an altitude camp right now? Yeah, I'm in Andorra. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, in Andorra. And is this for the tour? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whole team go or just a f- certain riders? 11. We need eight for the tour and then we bring here 11. So to make the last call probably after Swiss and Dauphine and see how people is. And yeah, normally we have already like six, seven that had the spot for sure. And then the last two positions in the band, two, one, two positions. We just see how it goes and yeah, hopefully hoping that everybody, everybody's uh, uh, healthy and performing well. And then, yeah, make the last call. Um, after to the Swiss, just ten days in front of the tour. Mm. Mm. So, super basic question, I guess. Do obviously you're going to altitude for the adaptations that we all most people know about. Is there any like specific things you guys look for, or do some riders maybe not do so well when they go to camp because of the change in altitude, or how do you guys handle that, like rider to rider? Yeah, it has to be like something uh, super. Yeah, we try to to have the full control of things. And that means we need you need to take yeah to have more a lot of information yeah from yeah whatever HRV heartbeats uh, weight uh, hydration uh, and then yeah and also depend on which kind of rider you have in front of you which the goal for him which would be the the job he has to accomplish in the tour and with all that then yeah you probably leave the hotel at the same time you come back at the same time but then during the ride yeah each of them have their own schedule mm. and then sometimes perhaps with some of them you just cut some volume or you add or depending on on how you see the the shape growing and the adaption you know you know um yeah active training it's something you get used to there's like kind of uh, that memory and uh, the more you go the less surprises you have normally um, mm. even though well, well, we have one rider here right, right now that is he has a big big experience in attitude training but we don't know really why uh, he's reacting really strong to the to the attitude which is also good on the other hand if you manage mm-hmm. it well then probably the, the benefit will be higher also so yeah but it's it's strange this time but yeah we just we, you need to be super on top of them and you know have a lot of control because here um yeah to me uh during an altitude training camp one less is always one more you know uh you know p- playing it on, on the safe side always normally pays off more than being kind of aggressive or risky mm-hmm. on, on the approach yeah mm-hmm. that's actually you bring up a really good point there like in terms of general training i think some people i think it was james piccoli was on the podcast and he said you know sometimes you got to push up against that envelope and go over the edge a little bit to find out what the edge is mm-hmm. when do you do that because you're right you're like The tour is not that far away. You guys don't want to be cratering people. I mean, it's just, are these athletes, you know, the guys, they're so in tune. I would, I would guess with their, they've been training for a long time that they, their feedback helps you guys dictate how hard to push them. Or, you know, you've got newer guys, let's say a 19, 20 year old who might not know that much. Like, how do you gauge that? That's obviously part of your job, but that you're really good at doing, but it's got to be so tricky, I guess. So you just always err on less than more or are there any like tricks you've picked up over the years i think it's it's a lot of being in the field also you know you can see a lot of things on the right you know one thing is what you you kind of prescribe and but then it's you know uh, in uh, there is a a way of saying in spain that says that more or less that paper handles everything you know you can write on a paper wherever you want this is a what i I don't know six hours with three climbs and boom 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 it's easy to, to to draw a plan but then the hard thing is to to make it happen you know and uh and during that um i'm, I'm kind of um i like to take uh, uh control risks and and um having always that core that i know it works and then depend adding some stuff a lot of times it's not that much uh i prefer to to bring some new stuff that uh, if it goes wrong will not affect that much mm-hmm. but you know Try to think in another way or try to do things that can add some value to to what i know it's working mm-hmm. and i try to, to make the step on that direction more than risking okay uh, let's put yeah one more set of uh yeah 30 30s or let's do i don't know one hour more or just let's put on this week uh, three four hours more over the week you know I, I, we are pretty at the stream on that on that kind of sense we know more or less where the limits are mm-hmm. uh, so there, I don't like it to to be too risky. 
I like more the, okay to perhaps the approach on how we um, you know mix the the load or um, how we can uh, be more precise on uh, on uh, on the workout and because uh, to me it's, it's it's about precision most most of the times you know you have to be precise in high performance and for that also I I I always try to to have different information sources. Um, and also, uh, and that link to being on the field and, and seeing the rider doing what you prescribe, you know, because you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you know your riders, and even if you feel when it's okay, now it's enough. You can, you need to kind of feel it. Say when you see a guy doing an effort on a TT bike, you say okay, and you you can see that he's kind of losing the the the, 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 the position and the the pedaling is not so so smooth anymore, and then that's the time to stop, probably. You know, say okay. Mm -hmm. That this is the time, even if perhaps it was, uh, I don't know, three, four minutes more offset or whatever, you know, say, so, okay, mm -hmm. now stop, relax. And then, so then just be precise in order to increase the quality. That's mm -hmm. kind of my, my view. So the execution of the intervals is super important. Yeah. To me, it's about, it's, it goes down. Um, I mean, you need the uh, first thing at all for me in, in, uh, in high performance is the first commitment. From the rider and whoever and the coach and the sports director, we all commit to to bring this team at the at the highest level in during the Tour de France. Um, that initial commitment needs uh, of uh, of uh, confidence in the athlete, but in all the the kind of the environment around him, mm -hmm. uh, and and then that needs over the time consistency, especially and finally precision. Mm -hmm. You know, so you need to be committed. And then you need to to be uh, consistent, and then you need to be precise. And with that, probably it's just a matter of time that performance will arrive. I love this because I don't know if that's why it's called 360 cycling that you started, but this is you see the full picture. It's not just the watts or the heartbeat. It's there's a lot going into yeah. this thing to be a successful athlete. Yeah, but I mean that's uh, that's that's the thing. I mean, I've been my a rider myself, so I've been sitting in the middle of that 360, you know, and then uh, I've been in 2006, I created my own uh, performance team when teams were not so so structured as we are now. So basically, okay, with, uh, I had my own nutritionist, I have uh, my own coach, my own psychologist, I have my own doctor, and I have my own uh, uh, osteopath and physiotherapist. So I created myself. And, and then, yeah, now I think that uh, I can have more or less a, a 360 degree view around the, the rider. And that's what I try to apply every day. Well, I'm going to link in the show notes that everybody needs to go read your psychology page. I absolutely love that. It's a short paragraph or like bullet points that I actually showed to some of the coaches that I work with. And I was like, I'm so pumped to talk to Patch because the fact that you put out that just highlights how much you know, as, as you said, as a rider, you've been working at the highest level of performance. Like you're just seeing the sport in a way that most people never will have the chance to, that I certainly won't have the chance to. But you really laid it out in a way that an amateur like myself can gain benefit from that to look at my own training and also how do I get that extra 1% that's not watts, but like getting my mind right for training and competition. So yeah, kudos on that. I really enjoyed looking through the site. So Thank you. yes, I sent over a bunch of uh, topics that I think a lot of amateurs ask yeah. about, but also that guys that are going to the next level are still curious about because there's almost too much information sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we'll get into some of the basics and just kind of run through those like yep. heart rate versus power, VO2 max stuff, strength training. And if there's any tangents or ways you want to mm -hmm. go, uh, feel free. Yep. When you guys, mm -hmm. and, and maybe this actually, I thought about you uh, when you were talking about the altitude camp. I was talking to a rider in France who said when he's at altitude, like he's pretty much doing his training off heart rate because his power is horrible. What do you do? Mm -hmm. Say they're not at altitude camp. Do you prescribe endurance rides by heart rate, power, RPE, or maybe a mixture of all of them? Because a lot of athletes mm -hmm. now don't know what to look at. What's your recommendation yeah. for that? Well, I think um, my recommendation is that uh, first thing, the more you know yourself, the better you would train, the better mm -hmm. feedback you will go give to your coach. And um, so it's, for me, it's really important to that the athletes listen to themselves and then mm -hmm. they, they, they can give you that feedback and for that i think the first thing i will uh i think it should be like a, you need like um how do you say 
like a driving license for to be like over the coaching where you should start with just with uh with a heart rate no power mm -hmm. meter that it, until you don't you don't ride your bike for two years with a heart rate then you don't have power and mm -hmm. then power mm -hmm. because a heart rate it's, uh, it's something we will will teach you about yourself mm -hmm. and it's uh yeah it's uh, it's uh, what the, the the load the impact on your body of the load you're you're getting over so i think first thing it's uh, it's hard rate, um because that gives you your information right mm. uh, if uh, then uh, second thing uh, okay if you have a power meter is exceptionally good but and that's fine but i think i myself uh, i was lucky um back in 1989 i've got my first polar sport tester and that helped me a lot and it helped to tell me to understand me better to know me better and still today, I can give you. I mean, I still remember a lot of, of information I got from that from that heart uh, monitor, and it's something I carry over my life. You know, mm -hmm. and it applies to all I do, and um, I still, you know, measure my heart rate every morning, and I give you information that it's it's me. You know, that's something you will uh, any athlete, any any rider will get forever. So I, I would say first thing, just focus on your heart rate. Uh, what are some of those things you got from it, though? Because some athletes might be listening and saying, well, I kind of know what my max is. I kind of know what I'm doing. When I'm doing threshold. Like, what would you look for just from heart rate? Well, I think that um, there you need somewhere like a coach like you could be that guides the, 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 the rider in this case, you know through that okay look this is what we do we, we can do a test and then i think that's that's one of, the, of our biggest responsibility as coaches is to to me also like one of the goals of uh 360 cycling is it was to, to kind of i i know it sounds a little bit like big perhaps but it's to change people's life mm -hmm. and um to make, make an impact on, on how you live from their own you know and on that uh i really believe that um um pedagogy is something that we have to do as coaches so yeah you take that current monitor Probably you don't know nothing, but then it's up to us to say, okay, look, I will teach you some stuff about yourself. Mm. This is, we, we got all these tests. We are looking for this. Look at this, your, this, your tail, blah, blah, blah. From here, we will build our, your, your zones. Zone one is this, zone two is this. This is happening. We go through, we increase the, the intensity. They are okay. Here you arrive into the tail. Look here. It's, this is happening in your body. You need to be attentive from your own, blah, 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 you know. And I think it's it's about that. It's about um, you know uh, having someone that really you know takes your hand and, and give and, and gives you that first information. Mm -hmm. And with that first uh, short coaching uh, period, then you will be yourself who plays a, a little bit and in, 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 you know explores your body and say, okay, look, this is happening. And if you have the uh, you take the habit or you know measuring your heart at the morning every day, and you have had a really hard workout yesterday, you see the day after something happened. Could be higher, could be lower. Who knows? And then with that, you will just uh, be a, a different person over the time, and uh, and you will know yourself much better. Mm, I like that. What do you? I've been listening to some different podcasts, and it seems you know heart rate decoupling became became seems more popular in the past few years that people were paying attention to it. But then other. I hear other people on podcasts saying, "Hey, well, after three hours, like your heart rate's going to increase, and there's so many factors that could." increase it do you guys use heart rate decoupling at all to for like you know the hey you're getting uh, better aerobic efficiency or are you more in the camp of like you know after a few hours it's going up um mm -hmm. is it something that athletes should be paying attention to well i i do pay attention i don't get crazy about it and mm -hmm. uh, it helps me especially um I again it's during racing so that the riders can manage themselves better. Mm -hmm. So this is watch out if this is happening, watch out, you know. Take a look to this because normally when that happens, it's late. So uh it's like uh, the alarm, it's getting too late. It's not when that's happening, probably in the in the you know and the the fire is on, then it's not that much you can do. Yeah. If, if the intensity is too going you know you probably need to take a, a pretty conservative uh, strategy on your race and but you know knowing it's always good you know i always say that you know information leads me to take better information better decisions you know and mm -hmm. if i see this is happening and probably i need to take another approach in my race you know if i'm in the last climb of uh, on the 5k and i see that happening Probably there are attacks I will never look to them. I, I know I just need to keep riding this tempo and that because my goal has to be to, to get to the finish line on, on the minimum time possible.
So mm. and for that, I, in this situation, then I do this. So are you, do you guys have every rider's metrics during the race in the team car? Like power, heart rate? No, that's, okay. That's that's not allowed. That's not allowed. Okay. But there, there we go back to the way I, I understand. Yeah. Uh, well, well, being in a team and, and leading or helping riders to, to perform it is to, again, I, I really believe in, in you know, in, in teaching pedag- pedagogy, you know, so teaching to the riders, okay, okay. For me, uh, the smarter the rider, the better. You know, mm. so I, we try always to give them. Of course, every rider is different, and there are some that they can deal with. Uh, I don't know seven numbers at the same time. There are others that are simply with two that are just getting nuts. So, uh, but I always try to give them as much uh, information as they can handle, so that they can take the best decision. You know, and then it could be like core temperature, skin temperature, both uh, linked with uh, with power, and yeah. And then that's that's something that can help to take a a better decision at some point. That's awesome. When you're prescribing VO2 max training, do you do that by heart rate or power? Normally power. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you had mentioned 30 30s before. Are there specific sessions that you stick to or is that specific to each rider sort of a way that they execute certain ones better? Or do you have Mm -hmm. favorites that you give to athletes? Uh, It depends on every athlete because um, what I link is the so okay yeah, there are different ways of of, of working out on the, the vo2 max and i try to give every athlete the, 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 that those that i know it's helping him more some mm. uh, for example uh two same athletes yesterday we have fear workout it was like uh, 10 minutes of vo2 max on a, on a long climb and then some tempo and then other 10 minutes at the end uh, one rider was doing 30 30 is the first uh, 10 minutes and and 40 20 is the second um, but there was another rider was to uh, try going uh, to one minute stuff, one mm-hmm. minute in the, in, the one in the top because he had he need more that kind of uh, on on the on his power profile and also on, on the race situation he struggles more with with that kind of timing. So on the time limit uh, curve, I, I need to I, in one I, I needed to, to kind of work out more between the thirties and the the forty second stuff and, and the other ones like for one and two minutes. Mm. So I just give them same amount of of uh, of uh, of uh, VO2 max, but on different way. Do you? Can I ask you what software do you use to look at post ride analysis? Well, I'm uh, we are using WKO mainly. Okay, cool. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm calling it. And then we have our own. Then we have our own uh, some software that we created our own with Telefonica, it's, uh, yeah, Spanish uh, technology company, and then we create some stuff because problem we have now it's about big data. We have too many numbers, and then we are so a lot of times we are just trying to predict stuff and and simply the, the tools we need uh, they don't really exist, so we need to create them. About um, yeah, it's more about looking at of uh, kind of performance patterns that. But, uh, or like uh, things that uh, linked to a good performance, you know. So we are trying to look for that, and that also we use it. Mm-hmm. So what do you think? What would what software? What like graphs or like these performance patterns? Are you trying to find what's not out there yet? That if and if you can't answer that, I understand. But what's kind of missing well, that Pachi's like? Damn, I wish I could see this. Well, I think that uh, simply there's. Um, that I've seen some race situations where things happen and, and we don't really have um, so all this stuff born, uh, was uh, I, I started with a day where we have a, a very important race and we have our leader was fighting with another big leader and then we were able to put uh, that guy under, under pressure and finally we didn't yeah we didn't achieve or we didn't get the, the prize I hope uh, but uh, for sure he was struggling that's 100 percent sure and um probably we get into that situation after um, something that happened that we were not able to kind of see you know so mm-hmm. i'm pretty sure that, that day or the days before if we could look to, to different stuff we could probably see that there was a, something happening you know mm-hmm. uh, but that happened there and then perhaps it happened again but we didn't we were not able to see it you know, and use that situation tactically in our advantage. So that's kind of uh, and kind of it. And also, on another hand, mm, uh, we have uh, forty-six riders, men's and women's, mm, but all these riders they are the exceptions of the rules. So they are exceptionally good. Mm-hmm. So um, the bunch of people we work with, um, even if there's a lot of uh, science done, but it's not with. Uh, I can tell you that a lot of papers, I can with with my office, they don't work. 
You can mm-hmm. say this and this and that, but I can tell you every day 45 times that that's not true. Mm-hmm. You know, so basically uh, the problem and the, and the luxury problem we have, I would say, is that we work with uh, exceptionally good athletes. So science don't apply here too much. I, I love that you say that because I love the science, but I feel like cycling it's in the past couple of years has become so much if there's not a study, then it doesn't work. And that's not how science works. Like there's a lot of stuff that you've learned over the years from experience and just mm-hmm. being in the trenches doing the work that it's not in a lab. And I'm scratching my head a little bit because there's so many top athletes like yourself and coach that are like, okay, it's not just the science. So to hear you say that, I think we'll give some relief to some amateurs that aren't doing everything quote unquote by the book, but they're finding benefit from certain sessions. Like if it works for you, keep going and then you know That's try and okay. experiment with some different things here along the way um my last question on kind of workouts you had mentioned something maybe it's a six hour ride and go rip these three climbs how often is the workouts for athletes like this a little bit maybe maybe not go by feel but a little more fart lick style of you've got a long ride when you're feeling it, just go hit it is that maybe a certain time of the year maybe pre-race where they're just trying to stay sharp or is that more like how do those fit in or maybe they don't fit in that often yeah they fit at all they feel absolutely yes so i think that i they, i call them solar rides mm. you know where you need to understand or at least how i understand is that um, sometimes you know we all like we are here because basically we we like riding our bikes you know mm-hmm. and that means that um, riders they need also the freedom they need to okay hey tomorrow uh, go out for five hours find a nice loop don't push too much if you need if you feel you need to push push but uh, the goal has to be to enjoy riding your bike mm-hmm. and at the same time having that volume we want you know but just feel free and and you know feel the air on your face and then uh, you enjoy the descents and enjoy the climbs and that's it you know because it's basically what, what we like so i they fit i would say almost one once a week okay. Not on, once a week but for sure every 15 days yeah that's every awesome days so it's how i mean it's and we need to i mean in wherever and you go where where the the goal of those rides is just to make you in, in peace with yourself mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. relax just enjoy and uh do what you feel you you need to do and then you feel alive you know that's it i love that i love that so you have a little uh information on strength training on your site for 360 cycling so usually my question is yes or no but maybe a better question for you is who, what athletes should be strength training and are there any that should not be? No, the, 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 the question, so the question is yes or yes. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> they, they, no, no. Everyone has to go to, 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 have to, to they, we all need to hit the gym. All. Mm. Why do you think cycling is uh, so uh, far behind this? Because there's so many cyclists that don't want to do it. I'm a huge strength fan. I mean, I've... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, I, I was lucky in life to find some, you know, different people that uh, coach me. And uh, I myself, that I, I was talking to you, I think that was, that was probably 1995. And um, yeah, I was seeing that, uh, yeah, we were doing those regular 12 or 10 weeks uh, gym uh, periods from, yeah, 1st of December to second week of uh, February. Then I was starting in the in the U23 racing program in in here in the in the Basque country and but yeah at the, at the beginning I, f- I felt like super good and you know I could feel that uh, you know uh, I could push some gear and you know I, I felt also like physically like strong but then that feeling was getting over you know so that year say okay well in the month of June normally it was like a break I say oh I will go back to the gym see what happens mm-hmm. and uh, the second part of the season was by far the best for me and until that moment and then I understood that yeah, this we need to keep it, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, because otherwise, uh, at the end, to me, all the movements in in uh, in sports are a, a representation of the of the core for, uh, strength by the time, you know. A pedal stroke is you you do some you put some 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 strength some Newton over uh, a pedal that is linked to a crank that then and that has a speed, you know, angular speed. 
uh, if you run and you are running and then you have you have to put fit on the ground that has a, uh, a impact time that will give a strength that will push you everything you're rowing the same so to me basically almost any movement this is a, it's a, a manifestation of, of uh, the strength over time you know? mm -hmm. so that means that uh, uh, also on a, on a pedal stroke there is um, that the short time of time uh, that that short period of time where you need to apply that that that, power, that uh, strength on, on the pedal but also there it has to be quality quality because you have a shorter period of time to, to apply so there we go it's a little bit harder but and and also uh the the highest is your maximum uh, strength or power you you the same ftp on a relative way will be smaller so I mean, you will become more efficient so uh, and efficiency will grow in that way because mm -hmm. every if you have a tp of 350 and your maximum power is 1000 watts it's not the same as if the same power uh, of ftp 350 with 1500 mm -hmm. relatively that's mm -hmm. you know every pedal stroke or your ftp will be way farther from from your maximum that means you will be more efficient and you and and and, and if you put on that, on top of that some neuromuscular stuff then you have probably the the perfect pedal stroke so that's why and, and also for the health you know if we ride just our bikes then it just it just discompensate our your shoulders will be not good and and you first start having knee pain because you know your vastus medialis is not compensating your um, your patella and then you have having knee issues so mm -hmm. it's just uh I need to go to the gym that's it and that's all year round yep cool so what do yeah. athletes can they you know they've got travel they've got a lot of races is it once a week once every other week or how do you what would be like the best regimen for them obviously there's no no i mean nuances it depends but... on uh depends on the goal there are some periods where there's just strength periods and then there are other which is racing periods Depends also on if if it's a classic rider, uh, yeah, and if it, or it's just a, a, tour, a grand tour or or one week races. It would depend, but yeah, it's normally if there's one week races is one a race every month, I would say or so. Grand tours normally, you know, it's one or two maximum a year, mm -hmm. and classics, yeah, on the on springtime there is kind of, I mean, I would say like they they race like three times a week or so. But mm. on different days, but not in a row. So that's kind of it. Mm. Okay. Nutrition. Obviously, people know that you need to try and eat healthy as an athlete and get carbohydrates and, you know, full balanced meals. What do you think are some of important aspects that you see some of the pros missing on the bike? Things they might not be doing right. Well, I think in general, there is uh, people doesn't really know how to eat properly and mm. uh out of the bike and in the bike. So I think there's um, that um, we all know that what's healthy and what not, but probably we don't know the quantities. And I think the biggest thing I can see it's uh, people eating too less mm -hmm. and um, and probably too far away from what they should or not in the right time. But mainly too less in terms of uh, of uh, carbohydrates probably, and uh, that's the biggest mistake I see still mm -hmm. today in professional cycle. What do you, can you go in on the timing a little bit more? Let's say somebody has a race on Saturday. Do you think people are, when you say that, are they waiting until Saturday morning to eat their carbs? Or would you recommend them starting on like Thursday night, eating a little bit more? What sort of a strategy that you try to employ with the movie um, star guys? If it's, if it's one, just one, one race day, probably with 48 hours of yeah, carbo loading should be enough. Um, but also also out there i'm not a big fan of, of a big carbo i think that if you do it right through the whole week then you shouldn't be too worried about your your uh your glycogen storage mm -hmm. but uh yeah normally if not yeah 48 hours before the night 40 hours before and then the day after the day before just a race that should be enough also and, and that's kind of it you had me thinking with the few days before a big race what kind of it's probably individualized so there might not be an answer to this what's a good a taper that most of these guys are doing or women that are doing uh going into maybe two or three days before let's say a big classics race but what you mean in training or uh do they reduce their training much there's i'm always curious there okay. was a paper road to gold that looked at these nordic skiers because we have all these theories on tapering and oh you know cut the volume in half keep the intensity other people say different things and they looked mm -hmm. at you either had to have won an olympic medal or i believe it was like a world cup race and super high level athletes they didn't cut their training much at all um and so i'm always just curious do are, 
like, do we hear as amateurs, like all these things about tapers and maybe the best in the world aren't tapering that much, or do they just rest, you know, do they do like an opener's ride the day before? And maybe instead of riding five hours, they ride three hours or. Well, normally, I mean, I, we caught for sure the last two days, you know, we got the volume pretty much, but I like like three days before having a, a, a nice, nice ride in like, um, yeah, I would say around four hours. Okay. And with some um, yeah, some touch, depending on I, what I think it would need more and also the kind of ride is, uh, the race is. But uh, yeah, I like it like that uh, 72 hours before uh, last stimulus. Normally the day before the 72 hours, there's a kind of an easy day. And then five days before there's like, like last that big day. Okay. So it's basically that. Yeah. yeah. I put the last big day five days before. One easy day with the gym the day after, just uh, some riding, and then some some kind of uh, just uh, yeah strength workout, but really yeah with with lots of precision also there in terms of um, the, the speed of movement of the bar, uh, and then I jump to that medium size uh, day seven two hours before, and then the last two days are super easy. The day the day before just one activation, and two days before I try to be around two and a half hours. Okay. Speed of bar. I'm hearing more about this and there's new devices to measure this and everything. So lifting there, are they going by speed now and you're monitoring that or is it just lifting yeah. by volume of weight or what do you, what are you guys doing in the gym? No, no it's uh yeah, we work with encoders. It's already okay. a couple of years. Yeah. I, I personally started with encoders, I think in 2015. So okay. yeah, you know exactly which is the speed that uh, will not hurt the rider. That will be on anyway. Will be a good stimulus for for him to 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 be yeah to to be activated on that case to don't lose that uh, that power, that strength, and then yeah we just work with that and then we see kind of kind of that we we just look to the loss of the speed and we stop when we arrive to limit. Okay. Because, you know, one day, one day. If it's seven repetition, it's seven. But if it's a bad day, and it's three, it's three. Okay. This is a little bit more scientific than my method, which is usually when I'm in races and I try not to feel like a burn when I'm lifting. You know, I'm making sure that my strength is in the same ballpark. But you have it dialed a little bit more than I do, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> not surprising. <laughs> okay. If it's work, if it's working for you, then it's fine. We will back to the same. Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Okay. Okay. Um, last nutrition question for you. Uh, what about carb restricted training or fasted training? Do you guys, uh, take advantage of that or is it mm. something that not worth the time? Yeah, we, we, we also do like faster rides and, and some like a nutritional training also on a, yeah, low carb uh, disposable uh, situation or, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like it. I was myself, I was doing it already when I was a rider. So I, I think there are some benefits, not just not to say, I want to say it's just about efficiency, but also about uh, how your next meal will get into your body. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, yeah, it's about those two things. So what is that? I don't, what would, so when you go out and you haven't eaten, you go do what, maybe a 90, 120 minute endurance yeah. ride. And then what's happening when you're eating after? That uh, all, uh, yeah. in that situation, uh, that, uh, that breakfast will get into your system on a better way. So there are some, okay. some activations. Some, that, so you will just, the absorption of, of the nutrition will, will be better. It's like a training so that you, okay. can, you, know, you, you get gets everything better. Okay. What's um, kind of some miscellaneous questions just looking at these riders? Like you said, you have all of these really unique and outlying individuals. I'm sure over time you get to you, you learn more about them. And let's say you have a new rider, though. What? How do you see maybe signs of fatigue or at the other end of the spectrum, signs of fitness? Like, oh, they're starting to ride really well. Obviously, power numbers or is it just performance or things they're telling you? What are? How do you take this 360 view of this rider mm -hmm. to say, okay, we're going in the right direction or uh, this is not looking so good. We need to kind of change course here. What are some... Maybe signs. Yeah, well, first up. thing, first thing, it uh, it depends on. It starts with a uh, with a good chat with the rider, probably at the beginning of the year to understand. Um, because to me, coaching is you know, it's I don't coach two riders in the same way mm -hmm. because I, we all are different. You know, okay, I have my kind of my 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 those bullets that I will go through always, mm -hmm. but the way I give to every rider is different. You know. 
and there are some riders that they need uh, like super structure uh, workouts with okay you the 20 minutes warm up blah 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 but there are others that simply they they, don't, they can't go to that thing you know so on that first chat first thing you need to understand which kind of rider you have in front of you and what he needs because at the end the coach the goal of a coach is to take out the best performance possible for each rider and mm -hmm. with some you need to to be to call them every night and to be in top and to ask about the feeling blah blah and always just simply with a, a simple you know message on sunday night it's not you know mm -hmm. um and from there you will understand also uh, which kind of uh, needs he has and and then normally there's like a pattern where you know people that is more like uh, on a traditional training way um you need to push more to to have some some kind of works done but also you know that it's it's gonna be probably hard to to have them burn you know because mm -hmm. you know that traditional training it's like more of our volume so there you shouldn't be too worried about it um but if you want them yeah for a class for example ready on that day you will be you'll have to find a way of making them do this kind of intense stuff that probably they don't like but they, because they had a, a bad experience in the past or whatever or simply because the way they were doing things it was already successful mm -hmm. and uh but on the other hand you can have someone that it's like uh he's pushing he he comes from you know from from a um model of performance where intensity has to be present almost every day then you need to with this kind of rider probably you you need to keep an eye because it's easier that they can learn mm -hmm. and then i simply see about uh you know the accumulation of the volume and the intensity gives you a ramp, right? It's mm -hmm. the ramp of how, how you're getting in shape, you know, how you're building up your shape. Mm -hmm. And there are some gradients of the ramp that you know that, that you can't sustain for a long period. So, okay, you can kind of, if it is kind of right, okay, you, you can let them do, okay, we do it like this, but next week it will be a recovery week. Mm -hmm. So you need to work in advance so that that ramp at the end, the average, it's, it's what you want, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of it that, um, you need to deal with the, the kind of rider you have and some do, some you will have to push and others you have to pull you know mm -hmm. when you you made the comment of you know someone that might be used to too much intensity what do you think is an ideal number of and again this is like a very general question it's hard to dial for every rider but how many times should a rider be going hard per week not more than every 72 hours Okay, that's the maximum. So, so if you Monday, went on Monday, you're not going to go again until Thursday. Yeah. Okay. But like depends that. how was Monday. Probably also Friday. Mm -hmm. I always there, anyways, yeah. it's always interesting when you have the athlete that does the like they kind of like check in on their fitness. They go to the endurance ride and then they got to go for the KOM. And I'm like, I don't know. You, yeah. you did it yeah. so well until the end. You were almost yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, because they are just chasing the number mm -hmm. because they need that number to confirm that the shape is good so that normally it's, it's born back from a from a you know a, not a lack of self-confidence mm -hmm. so, okay what yeah. do you think there, you see we go back to what we said before you know that for high performance you need a commitment of confidence and yourself and whoever is just teaching you or, or leading you to that performance you know? i love that yeah and if so, you don't have the trust on your coach and yourself and you need to check your number because you're this in then you'll never get high performance mm. i learned so much from all these chats but this is actually a great tool that i'm going to employ of just simply asking them hey do you trust what we're doing if mm. not like you know you don't want to do this check-in and here's why and i try to explain that but this is you're taking mm. it a, la a layer backwards of you know are, are you believing in the program these are the goals or do you not feel like we're on the road and I appreciate that. That's a really good one. So that that would actually my answer might be that for this question for you. What have you learned about coaching that's made you better at coaching? Well, uh, hard to say. Mm, probably, I mean, it. Um, I have spent quite a bit of time thinking about um, things about coaching that then apply to the rest of my life. And again, uh, high performance, and you know, with my wife, it's it lies down the same thing, you know. It's uh, we we had twenty two years ago a commitment to, to get married. Uh, we trust each other, uh, and, and trust has to be part of our, of uh, of our marriage. Uh, we are uh, consistent in our lives, uh, and we try to be precise. So what I would say is that everything that coaching or I learned thinking about coaching, then a lot of things apply to my my life or to everything in my life. And and, and if you see someone that it's kind of um, uh you know uh kind of 
I would say picky on the on the training, and you know, then probably will be like this on his life, you know. And if you see someone that is like, oh, whatever, then normally that applies also life. So I think mm. it's like through coaching, I, I learned that a lot of things that happen in coaching then happens in life. Mm. Very, that's very true. I'm thinking of some people right now that that's making me <laughs> chuckle a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What similar type of question, what's maybe and either as rider or coach or maybe just life, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, um, probably that um, nothing lasts forever mm. and that, um, you know, just uh, be here, the here and now that's most important and that uh, enjoy what you are doing right now because you don't know what will happen tomorrow mm. and uh, and really, you know, uh, enjoy it on, on the day on the wide uh uh the wideness that that expression has you know enjoy enjoy what you are doing because it's it would, nothing will last forever mm. and, yeah. I mean, also i i remember uh you know when when peter won Paris where that moment where i said okay this is kind of something big that i will never forget and uh, that at that moment i thought that this is probably not happening in, anymore you know so mm. And I enjoyed big time because I think it was aware that of of uh, how hard I would be, but I also I was aware where we I was and who I was I had in front, what he achieved, and and how lucky it was to be just uh, by his side. You know? So yeah. that's amazing. I can only imagine what that felt like. It's uh, and to work yeah. with Peter is like, yeah. yeah. Were there anything about him? I mean, he's like super freak athlete. What was the most surprising thing about working with him? I mean, how much of an athlete he is. Uh, an athlete on the, yeah, he's unbelievable. What he can do with his, with his body, you know, it was like, it was so fun to be with him. Yeah. It was, you know, it was always for new things and trying new stuff and that was so cool. So, and yeah, he's he was, I mean, he decided to be a bike rider, but I'm sure if he, you know, decided to, to play, I don't know, uh, ice hockey, probably mm-hmm. he would be somewhere in the US, you know? So, yeah. yeah. He he can do whatever he wants. Yeah, it's crazy. Plus, his personality and humor just seems second to yes. none. <laughs> so yeah. you'd mentioned you'd mentioned the word tomorrow. My last question for you: What excites you about the future of training, coaching, cycling? What do you kind of see that you got your eye on down the road? Well, probably to the 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 era we have about um, what we are creating about all the information we have and in that next step and that, that next level where there's a lot of things happening and you know i think that there was like uh, uh during the yeah year 2010 or so i think there's a democratization uh, sports are much more democratic in terms of performance before you know um the performance what was just you know in cycling for example you we professionals we were just uh, just having all the information and knowing mm. what our srm was saying afterwards i think there's a big uh, democratization of, of of the sport and that uh, opens a new era with a lot of people thinking about it and and um and that i think that would bring much more uh nice good good things to the to the field and i'm open for that um trying to to open my eyes and and seeing what where we can go right now you know but i think that, that what we have in front of us is super cool i think it's um like uh the golden era of, of cycling probably and uh yeah i just want to be part of it that's awesome man Thank you, Patrick, for doing this. I appreciate it. I'm going to link to your guys' website. What's a good way for people to follow along with you? Are you active on like Twitter or Instagram or anything like that? Instagram, is, it's a good, uh, it's a good way. Instagram or Twitter, both. Cool. That would be the work. So, yeah. Uh, any yeah. any final words for the listeners? No, thanks for for your time. Thanks for oh. for for having me here. And yeah, I hope that uh, people just ride the bikes a lot, uh, a lot of uh, health and, and miles for them. And yeah. That's it. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Patchy. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll talk to you soon.